In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Among all the works of God's mercy, which from the beginning have been bestowed upon and for men's salvation, none is more wondrous and none is more sublime than that Christ was crucified for the world. Indeed, dear Christians, the crucifixion of our dear Lord Jesus is wondrous and sublime because of who he is, because of who the sacred scripture reveals him to us to be. There's a young scholar coming up named Stephen Nemesh, and he has recently put out a book on tradition and hierarchy, and sadly he became a Unitarian. He was a Trinitarian and was considering Roman Catholicism, and then he thought twice and for some reason way overcorrected into the worst possible ditch you can think of, which is Unitarianism, that is the denial of the divinity of Jesus. And he says that these kind of questions are metaphysical and don't really need to be fettered out because they're not determinative for who has friendship with God. Well, this is most absurd. And so the crucifixion of Jesus, again, is most wondrous and most sublime because of who he is. And the Holy Christian Church, on the basis of the sacred scripture, confesses that the one person of the Word of God incarnate poured out his lifeblood for the sins of the world. A mere man could not do that. It would be impossible. Abel's blood cries out for vengeance. But only the blood of God can cry for mercy. Now, of course, divinity is impassable. That is, it is incapable of suffering. Yet we must confess that it was God who was indeed scourged. God cannot die, yet we must confess that the Jews put to death the author of life, as St. Peter proclaims in the book of Acts. And thus in one of our passion hymns, it is starkly written, O sorrow dread, our God is dead. But this can be no more startling, really, to us than when St. Paul tells the Ephesian elders that God purchased the church with his own blood. And so be of one mind, dear Christians, in affirming what at first glance seems improper to affirm. That is again, O sorrow, dread, our God is dead. The church has addressed the heresy of Nestorius, who refused to refer to the Blessed Virgin Mary as the Mother of God, as the Theotokos. As he saw it, such a title says too much, because God does not undergo natural birth. As Cyril of Alexandria reports, at its worst, Nestorianism posits two sons, posits two persons, the person of the Son of God, who is eternally begotten before all worlds, on the one hand, and the person of Jesus of Nazareth, a descendant of David, to whom the person of the Son of God closely allied himself with. But the problem, of course, as Cyril notes in his work on the unity of Christ, is that this would make the relation between the second person of the Holy Trinity and Jesus of Nazareth no more different, really, than his relation with any Christian. The view of the Incarnation that becomes associated with Nestorius is expressed with the analogy of the gluing together of two boards. The problem here, of course, is that there is no real sharing, no communion of the two natures, no assumption of humanity into divinity, as we confess in the Athanasian Creed, no full dwelling of the Godhead bodily in Christ Jesus, as St. Paul so clearly proclaims. And indeed, it is heretical to suggest that there are two distinct persons at work in Jesus of Nazareth. Thus and so, we affirm that there is one person of the Word of God incarnate. Now, Cyril, for his part, affirms the unity of Christ to such an extent that at times in his treatise, he sounds like a monophysite. That is, one who affirms one nature in the Son, 
a divinization of the flesh, as it were, in such a way that the humanity is transformed into divinity. That's not his position, finally, but it does sound a lot like it, because these terms, nature and person, are still being refined at this point in church history. And for example, earlier fathers referred to the co-mixture of divinity and humanity as a way to describe the incarnation prior to Eutyches, a guy who was a monophysite, and he spoke of a new nature in the incarnate Son. Or prior to the Arian controversy, St. Athanasius writes in his Confession of Faith that the Son is like the Father. But of course that expression is anathema and decidedly rejected after Nicaea 1. What Cyril affirms, and what we all must affirm, is that when we stare into the face of Jesus Christ, we are staring into the face of God. And further, when the Holy Spirit gathers us together to give consideration of this atoning work of our Lord Jesus Christ, we must affirm, we cannot fail to affirm that very God of very God was stricken, was smitten by God and afflicted. That God was scourged beyond human semblance. That God's beard, as Isaiah says, was torn out. That God was mocked that God was crowned with thorns, that he was marched to Golgotha, and he was pierced. We nevertheless again affirm the impassibility of divinity. But we cannot fail to affirm that because Jesus is God, God suffered. We must confess it. It's the same sort of syllogism as is used to affirm that Mary is Theotokos. Jesus is God, Mary bore Jesus in the womb and gave birth to him. Therefore, Mary bore and gave birth to God. Fairly simple. Fairly straightforward. Did Mary generate his divinity? Well, God forbid that we say that, of course, lowering the divinity to the status of a creature. But she did give birth to God. And Mary became God's mother. Wondrous and sublime indeed. And as it might be thought, too heady. It's too metaphysical, as some may think, like Stephen Nemesh. Too dogmatic to relate to the individual and communal life of Christians. But I'm in agreement with C.S. Lewis, who writes, quote, For my own part, I tend to find the doctrinal books often more helpful in devotion than the devotional books. And I rather suspect that the same experience may await many others. I believe that many who found that nothing happens when they sit down or kneel down to a book of devotion would find that the heart sings unbidden while they are working their way through a tough bit of theology with a pipe in their mouth and a pencil in their hand. The article of faith that we call the person of Christ is so wondrous and sublime, it is challenging, it is trying. The terminology is often difficult to wade through, and the head, no doubt, can often spin in the process. But the comfort of this article is expressed most basically and most clearly by St. Paul. When in our epistle, 2 Corinthians 5, he writes, One has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him for their sake, died and was raised. And what is the reason that St. Paul can say that in this one who died, all have died? Well, he can say it because, as he goes on to write, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. These are not mere trifles. These are not mere heady metaphysical questions that we can just simply say, eh. We'll take the most simplistic reading, the most surface level uh, reading of the Bible, and come to all sorts of strange conclusions, and exclude from our thought, and exclude from our confession, that this one, Jesus of Nazareth, is indeed God and Lord, as he confessed before the chief priests, as he confessed before Pontius Pilate. And to what end does he do these things? To what end was God in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them? For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, 
so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. All of what St. Paul proclaims in the epistle reading is possible again because Jesus Christ is the one person of the Word of God incarnate. He is able to uphold the Word of God and unbind us from the legal hold of death because he has assumed humanity. And he is able to do it for all because he is true God indeed. And although we must say, of course, it is proper to human nature to suffer, and that it is proper to the divinity to effect a work for the world, nevertheless, all was done by one person, even Jesus Christ the righteous, who in the cry of triumph proclaims, it is finished, as we heard yesterday. He loved them to the end. It is fulfilled. It is culminated. It is brought to its most fitting end. He who knew no sin was made sin. That is, he had the sins of the world, had your sins, reckoned to him, so that to you can be announced the reckoning of righteousness. As we heard from Isaiah, that he might account many righteous, that he might declare them free from sin, what Leo the Great calls a wondrous exchange, what Luther calls a blessed exchange, that is the heavenly bridegroom does all for you, his dear bride. And he takes to himself all that is yours, putting it away so that now joined in communion with very God, you are spotless, you are blameless, you are without spot or wrinkle, holy and righteous and clean. To Christ be all the glory, in Jesus' name, amen.